that later that they will also want to make uh, inputs. We'll see how we accommodate them. Um, are there apologies? Uh, I didn't receive any apologies. Sir. Okay, no apologies. Uh, let's go to item two, the public hearings on the draft taxation laws amendment bill and the draft tax uh, what happened? And the draft tax administration laws amendment bill. So each stakeholder will be allocated uh, 10 minutes. Uh, the first one is Beer Association. Uh, they are ready. Their screen is already flighted. Uh, Beer Association, uh, over to you. It's, uh, you know, it's strictly stick to uh, uh, 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you to the committees of finance chairs and uh, honorable committee members. Uh, sorry, Chair, I have to say I did laugh because I am also part of Born Before Technology, BBT. <laughs> so uh, thank you. I was very nervous. Thank you for making me a little bit more relaxed. Okay. Uh, thank you, uh, members. I will try and stick to my 10 minutes and uh, I just want to land one or two key messages on behalf of BASA today. BASA is a industry organization. We are funded by our members, South African Breweries, the Craft Brewers Association of South Africa, as well as Heineken. And so when I present today, I have my colleague with me, Gregory Marks from BASA, who will be co-presenting with me. I'll do the main presentation. He can then come in when he needs to. He is our technical expert. But I also have our members in the house today online if they do need to add input. But this is just setting the context. We have been in uh, operation since 2019. And it is really to represent the voice of the beer industry in this country. It's very important for us to not forget our partners in this value chain. And we call it from barley to bar because our agricultural input is very critical in terms of our industry. Without our hops and our barley farmers, we are nothing. We cannot produce our product. Of course, without clean water, it is very integral to us. So sustainability is a big part of what we do and what we focus on and what we invest in in the country. And then we move all the way in terms of our actual brewing process, which is our our microbreweries, which is part of our entrepreneurship programs. In KZN, we've worked with the KZN Liquor Board just to train uh, over 100 women moving from a tavern industry into brewing. So this is our value chain that we want to represent to you. And these slides are available for everyone as well. And I'll go into some statistics shortly with you. Now, I would be amiss of me, and I don't want to be negative, but we have to look at where we're coming from. And in my last portfolio presentation last year, I did talk about the impact that our unfortunate COVID situation had not only on South Africa, but on globally in terms of our industry of craft brewers in particular, who are our smaller brewers. They can employ a minimum of 10 people in their brewery and can go all the way up to 100. And if you look at one person and the lives that they support between seven and 10 lives, as well as their communities. And we looked at a three year recovery period in terms of our craft brewers, and we are only in year one. I also need to say that we still are not getting any relief. We do not get any social grants. The banks do not give us any excess um, support in terms of applications of relief or funding or payment holidays. So we have as craft beer, suffered immense loss with 60% on the brink of closure still Hello, and 30% having closed their doors. Somebody person. So our total economic impact is important that we do create jobs. And this is all these stats are from our beers global economic footprint report by Oxford Economics. This is part of a global study that was commissioned by the World Beer Alliance. It is Africa, it is Europe, all our countries that have got together in the Beer Alliance and we worked on this report with Oxford Economics. So we are impartial with the results. It's 249,000 jobs in South Africa. We've just taken out the South African components, 71 billion in GBA, 
in terms of our GDP contribution, one rand for every 79 rand, and we look at a 43 billion tax revenue. In terms of our spend, the part that I do want to highlight, please don't just look at us as the bottle of the beer that you hold in your hand or that you pour into your glass. We also support the industries of marketers, lawyers, we look at canners, bottlers, artists of over 33 billion that we support, as well as beer industry workers are nine times more productive than average South African industry. Now, this is not me. This is the report that was commissioned by the World Brewing Alliance that has the stats. And this report is available for the uh, honorable committee members. The results of the budget 22 was very welcome. So thank you to everyone for that decision. The part that did disappoint us um, is the fact that wine had a 4.5% increase, beer was 5.5% and spirits were 6.5%. The disappointment is that beer is the lowest ABV, it's alcohol by volume. And in a society where we are trying to deal with social ills, we could not understand the rationale why a category with the lowest alcohol by volume was taxed higher. And this is the one thing that disappointed us, albeit that we were very happy with the fact that we, our input was considered with our near inflation related excise adjustment. What we are saying to table is in summary, we want some certainty in terms of the excise adjustment, in terms of a fixed in line with inflation for the medium term. Even if we know at least for the three years, we can plan. As I was saying on Croft, our recovery is at least another two years, we hope, away. And this would help us in terms of our certainty. And we'd also like to stress on the uniform application of alcohol by volume exercise. Because if we are saying it's alcohol by volume, then whether you're 4.5, 5.5, or 6.5, then you measure it. And this, we believe, will definitely help help in terms of our social harms. In terms of the tax incident rate, if you look at the divergence from the inflation rate of the relative year on year increase, it's resulted for us in a variance of 17.03. We have showed this graph before, so I will go through it very quickly. But if you look at this, ultimately, it does get levied on the consumer. And you may think that's great because then it becomes more expensive for the consumer to buy alcohol, the reality is, is that the consumer does not stop drinking. The reality is, is that we would rather focus in terms of making sure we use the funds that we get on social harm projects, which we do do. And there is a report in terms of the work that we're doing in that area. We are saying, can we at least have support in terms of entrepreneurs let's get the economy recovering let's make sure we create jobs we make sure that we have the impact of excise duty and we be able to benefit from benefit from that as a community in terms of this deviation which we believe it is we believe we can correct that and this is our opportunity and hence our appeal today um, honorable members so i hope i have met my time and i will leave on this last side i'm not sure if there's any questions Questions. Thank you, Chair. Thanks, Patricia. The questions will come later. And thanks for saving uh, uh, the three minutes. Uh, let's move to the next stakeholder uh, British American Tobacco South Africa. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, could I please ask that I be made a co host so I can present uh, my screen? Our chair or secretariat? Uh, Butler, can you make uh, Dane a co host, please? Let's try to be quick. We don't have time. Are you uh, able to see, Chair? Yes, you can see the the presentation. Fantastic. Uh, so, so firstly, I'd just like to thank you, Honourable Chair and the Honourable Committee members for affording me the opportunity to present. 
I, I think it's a, a fair statement to, to say that uh, in the vaping market, there are, are more unknowns than knowns. Uh, it's a nascent market and from the, the large amount of submissions in the public participation process, uh, we can see that, that there are a lot of questions that still need to be, be answered uh, about the market uh, and the impact of a, a potential excise on this market. Uh, from a, a BAT perspective, our, our key uh, point that we want to bring across is, is that excise needs to be collected uh, from all actors equally to ensure fair competition and an equal playing field for, for all participants. Uh, and there, there are a few key considerations uh, that, that we, we want to bring to, to the table. And I, I think the, the first one is, is this market is, is quite a small market, 0.5% of the entire nicotine products market in South Africa. There are a large amount of retailers uh, selling uh, vaping uh, products in South Africa, but there's a, an overproportioned amount of retailers creating their own liquids. And, and this is what is known as the, the do-it-yourself industry. Uh, and, and why it's quite important is that retailers uh, or, or manufacturers uh, can bring in, say, 10 litres of, of liquid, and they could convert this into 1,000 litres of, of e-liquids for, for vaping. Um, and, and why this is important is, is that is excisable product and it would cause an increase in, in excisable product. Um, and, and any process policy around excise would need to cover off this, this do-it-yourself segment as well. Uh, in addition, there, there are a lot of products, uh, complex product categories uh, driven by fragmentation, uh, different product types, and, and there are multiple actors. Um, so consumption in the market, we, we don't think is greater than 250 million milliliters per annum. Uh, however, will this, this uh, be captured by, by the tax net? Well, that depends on, on whether a robust excise framework uh, is, is put into to place. And, and that would be the only way to actually collect the excise from, from all uh, actors in the, the industry. So, so moving on, um, and, and just a, a bit more on, on the fragmentation, in the, the space, there, there are three main product types, one being uh, disposables, the other one being pods, and the third one being liquids. Now, um, the disposable and pods fall into what is known as closed systems, uh, and these are, are currently imported uh, into South Africa, so the, the majority of the, the products come from, from overseas. There are hundreds of formats available um, and different types of, of products available in the market, which would need to be covered uh, by the excise framework. With respect to, to the open systems, uh, this is where the, the large do-it-yourself uh, market come, comes into play. Uh, and we, we see multiple formats, uh, 10 milliliter up to 120 uh, milliliter in multiple bottle formats uh, in, in this market. So what we, we need to, to ensure happens in order for, for the excise to, to, to work and, and the, the actual revenue to, to be collected um, is, is firstly, we, we need a registration system that must be introduced with this excise. So uh, similar to other excise types, uh, people in the, the chain need to, to register, they need to license. Uh, and, and this will allow SARS to, to capture all participants in the industry. On top of it, uh, for, for those of you that, that know the industry, it isn't milliliter focused, but more puff focused. So people are more concerned on the amount of puffs they would uh, receive from, from a product. Um, and you, you don't often uh, get people talking about milliliter uh, e-liquid. So in order for the, the, the system to operate, uh, we would need ML markings uh, to be put on the outer product packaging uh, for the system to work, and this would ease administration uh, from, from SARS's perspective as well, because excise would be specific on, on a per milliliter basis. On top of it, uh, there, there's a lot of talk in the, at least the tobacco space around track and trace um, and implementing a uh, track and trace system to, to the, the current uh, tobacco market. But it would also be helpful if uh, a track and trace system with a unique identity code, so this could be linked to, to excise collection, 
is implemented from day one. And, and this will capture all movements in the supply chain uh, and all actors in the supply chain as well. And then lastly, uh, the, the instrument and the, the, the Exar system needs to be such that it, it assists in avoiding fiscal evasion. Um, and and when, when I say avoiding fiscal evasion, it would be to the benefit of the fiscus uh, and to SARS if the, the excise instrument was such that the broadest possible tax net was uh, initially implemented, capturing all market participants um, and, and excise then paid on, on the e-liquids. What, what could be, be dangerous is if a, an excise is introduced that's too high um, and looking at international examples such as Portugal, uh, this drove people into illicit straight away uh, and, and excise wasn't collected. If, if you look at European statistics, uh, expectation versus actual revenue collection attracts at about 25%. Uh, and this talks to, to uh, the lack of, of robust excise systems um, in order to ensure excise collection. Now, we, we put a, a proposal forward that the implementation date, which, which National Treasury said would be 1 June uh, 2023, uh, is actually pushed out to 1 January 2024, uh, because there are still a, a large number of questions that need to be answered and, and further public consultation that needs to take place. And to give a, a few examples, uh, licensing, uh, what are the security requirements required around bond stores? Uh, when will excise liability uh, be triggered? So what is the point of the liability? Uh, the payment cycle, every excise industry in South Africa has different payment cycles. Uh, what will it be for this, this product category? Bonded movements, what are the document requirements. Um, and I can go on and on, but I, I think the point is that further public consultation is needed uh, to answer these questions. So when the excise system is put in place, uh, it, it, it works efficiently and effectively to, to get revenue in and capture all players. Um, and then the, the rate. So, so if the, the excise framework is established and, and it needs to be a strong, robust excise collection framework, uh, then the rate is important and and we have done quite a bit of an, anal an analysis based on national treasury's own uh, workings uh, and and we are of the view that a rate of between 70 cents per milliliter uh, and 46 cents per milliliter would be appropriate why i'm showing it in this format we we also want to ease administration uh, for for sars and and people could avoid uh, paying excise on smaller quantities, especially in those closed systems. So what we are putting forward is that the first two milliliters would, would cover a, a flat rate, um, and then anything over the first two milliliters would, would carry the, the rate uh, per milliliter. But that would have to be between 46 cents and 70 cents based on our analysis, which feeds off uh, National Treasury's own analysis. Um, and then the, the last point before I close is, uh, like I say, we've done a, a lot of analysis, but we did commission Oxford Economics to perform an analysis uh, on international excise rates. They, they looked at South African affordability, uh, they looked at product pricing, and they concluded that um, a rate of 1 rand 45 per milliliter should be seen as the, the absolute upper limit in South Africa's case. Um, and then when they, they look at, at things such as price of product in the market, South African affordability, uh, they feel that 70 cents per milliliter would be more appropriate. And, and this is important because if, if an appropriate rate is brought in, the excise system um, can, can then be tested uh, over a number of years. There isn't an excise shock and, and SARS can improve it uh, over time. And if necessary, the, the National Treasury could then up this rate once that broad tax net has been established. Thank you, Chair. I, that's, that's all from our side. Hello. Do we have British America Tobacco online? I mean, in the platform? Hi, Chair. Yes, I've, I've finished with my presentation. Thank you.
Oh, you are representing British America Tobacco. Okay, I thought you are representing Viper Products Association. No, British American Tobacco, Jay. Oh, okay. Yeah, thanks, Jay. And then the Viper Products Association, are you there? Yes, I am here, Chair. Uh, good morning. It is a sign up. Before I start, Chair, can I just apologize? I've had a misfortune. My computer crashed a few minutes before we started, so I'm connecting from a device, and I'm unable to share my presentation, but I'll speak through my points, and I'll send it uh, just after, uh, once it has been sorted out. I do apologize about that. Is it in order, sir? Okay, no, no problem. Have you sent the presentation to the Secretariat before? No, I didn't. I didn't send it. I was just going to share from my screen. Okay, if there is a document, please email it to the Secretariat. But in the meantime, proceed with the presentation. Uh, Ten minutes. Will do so. Thank you very much. Good morning, honorable members of the Standing Committee and uh, colleagues. Uh, my name is Asanda Goyi. I represent uh, members of the Vapor Products Association of South Africa. We are an industry body that comprises manufacturers, wholesalers, as well as retailers of smoke-free vapor products in South Africa. We welcome this opportunity to highlight our views on the proposed tax on vaping e-liquid as put forward by National Treasury. In the interest of time, uh, Chair, I will restrict my comments to only the rationale behind the tax proposal, as we see this as being too problematic as a basis for the proposed tax. Our written submission, which was sent early this week, provides a full discussion on, on our position. The first point I'd like to touch on is the scientific basis for the tax is flawed. Treasury cites concerns that the introduction of new generation products, which include vaping products, may potentially undermine global tobacco control efforts. This could not be further from the truth. Electronic nicotine and non-nicotine delivery systems, which I will refer to as ENDS, in the rest of my presentation, have been proven to be a harm-reduced alternative to combustible tobacco. In our submission, we refer to multiple studies which have been conducted by credible international public health bodies, which clearly demonstrate that vaping should be seen as a less harmful alternative to smoking. The view of these bodies, which we share, by the way, is that ENDS should form part of a comprehensive tobacco control agenda, rather than being maligned in the same way as smoking. Treasury has raised concerns over youth uptake of vaping. The results of the Global Adults Tobacco Survey have revealed that the highest percentage of vaping prevalence in South Africa is between the ages of 15 and 24, and it's only at 3.1%. This number is low and it does not support any claim of a youth vaping crisis. The age range employed by the GET study uh, also fails to provide a clear picture of underage vaping, as users over the age of 18 are considered adult consumers. From what has been made available of the report, it is not clear at what frequency, for example, young people between the ages of 15 and 18 vape and whether their vaping is one-off experimentation or regular use, or how many of those who vape regularly were already initiated into nicotine when they took up vaping, and how many of those have quit smoking because of vaping. Don't get us wrong, while we agree that any youth vaping is not acceptable, we do wish to caution against measures that would deter even adult smokers from taking up vaping. The proposed legislation on tobacco control, which includes ENDS, is at this point the appropriate legal framework to frame the issue of vaping regulation and not excise. National Treasury also noted uh, the issue of gateway theory. Uh, there is a concern that the use of ENDS potentially initiates users to combustible tobacco. Unfortunately, uh, not enough, not, no information was provided or empirical studies to back this claim up. We propose that a rigorous study is conducted to evaluate this claim in order to avoid solving a problem that might not even exist. We are confident that the evidence will show that smokers use ends to quit rather than to stop to start smoking. 
The fourth point is the purpose of the excise duty. It is not clear what the projected impact of the proposed excise duty on vaping products is. In our view, this, this is an inevitable outcome of the nascent phase of the industry, as well as the gaping data gap, gaps in the foundational elements of the tax proposal. Treasury should conduct further assessment of the sector in order, firstly, to arrive at a scientific and balanced view of what ENDS represents for public health. And secondly, to solidly anchor this ta its tax proposal on an empirical understanding of the vaping sector in South Africa. To achieve both outcomes, we propose that first and foremost, Treasury commission a study to assess and answer the following questions. How many vapors are former smokers? How many vapors are never smokers? And how many of those are dual users? What is the expected outcome of the excise duty on vaping behavior? How much revenue is likely to be raised? And most importantly, what is the pro projected impact on small traders in the sector? There is a lack of connection between the proposed duty as well as its intended purpose. We believe that the proposed excise duty will be ineffective in achieving its intended purpose because Treasury has not demonstrated how the proposed tax will benefit public health. Neither the discussion document nor the explanatory memorandum accompanying the taxation proposal have demonstrated the gains to be realized from the imposition of a tax. It is our view that an excise duty will spawn an illicit industry and self-mixing of ingredients, which could have horrendous consequences for public health as well as for the legal industry. And the last point is the unintended consequences of the proposed excise duty. The introduction of the excise will have significant unintended and irrational consequences, which are at odds with the intended purposes. Firstly, the proposed excise duty will make vaping expensive, especially when considered against smoking and widespread availability of illicit tobacco. This goes against the doctrine of harm reduction. Secondly, the proposed excise duty will have a destructive economic impact on the vaping industry. According to the Oxford Economics Africa report on the economic impact of end product taxation in South Africa, the tax-driven price increases that would result from the implementation of the proposed tax may see an increase in the average price by up to 138% and cause e-liquid consumption to decline by 36%, and the vaping industry sales could fall by 22%. And thirdly, the proposed excise duty will lead to significant declines in sales of vaping products, and it could trigger a negative multiplier effect to an estimated 1,500 jobs, 360 million of the vaping industry's contribution to GDP being lost, and a significant reduction in tax contribution by the vaping industry in South Africa. So it is imperative uh, that government does the following before a decision is made. Conduct a socioeconomic assessment to have a clear view of how a tax will impact the industry, specifically businesses and jobs. Secondly, the South African Bureau of Standards should devise standards for testing of nicotine for products being declared. And lastly, we believe that until the above recommendations are put in place, we would urge the committee to defer adopting the proposed excise duty at this stage. However, if the committee deems that the tax is necessary, despite the glaring weaknesses pointed above, we recommend a tax rate significantly lower than the proposed rate and lower than the levy that levied on tobacco heated products given that ends are less harmful than both combustible tobacco cigarettes as well as tobacco heated products. And Chair, I ended there. Thank you for the opportunity to have our views heard. Uh, thanks, Asanda, for representing the uh, Vapor Products Association. Uh, and then, uh, as you have promised, please uh, email uh, your submission to the Secretary. Will do, Chair. Thank you. Pleasure. Let's move to the next uh, stakeholder, Association for Savings and Investment, South Africa. Good morning. I'm presenting on behalf of ASISA. Oh, okay. You're Thanks. welcome. 
All right. You have, you have got 10 minutes. Sure. On behalf of ASISA, we thank the Standing Committee on Finance for the opportunity to make a presentation on this very important topic for the insurance industry. Um, Angus, you can go to the background slide, third slide. Unfortunately, the darn thing's not moving again. Just stand on the presentation and, and uh, press on the drop downs. There we go, just on a back background, please. Another slide. There we go. Okay, background on IFRS 17. Tax for long-term insurers follows the five-fund tax approach. The International Accounting Standards Board issued IFRS 17 insurance contracts to replace IFRS 4 interim standard in May 2017. The effective date is for reporting periods commencing on or after 1 January 2023. IFRS 17 represents the most significant change to insurance accounting requirements in over 20 years. The effective date has been extended many times due to its complexity and the massive operational impact on insurers. IFRS 17 will have a material impact on the valuation of insurance contract liabilities and profit profiles, which can lead to a material surplus or deficit for tax purposes on transition. Insurance contract liabilities are a key driver of the tax calculation and are determined on an adjusted IFRS basis for tax purposes. We are pleased to see this basis carried forward in the T-Lab. Um, next slide. Our members view the following as important principles for the tax basis on the IFRS 17. The tax base must be protected and the tax contributions from industry should be stable. A sufficiently long phasing in period of the transition amount and suitable phasing in mechanism is needed to reduce significant liquidity constraints for insurers, i.e. insurers must have sufficient cash to pay the tax. This is particularly applicable to smaller insurers. A longer phasing in period also reduces volatility in tax collection for the fiscus. The payments need to align with the cash flows of insurers to ensure industry sustainability. To ensure the integrity of the information, the proposed adjustments to Section 29A must be fully disclosed for financial statement purposes and subject to external audit verification. And the last point, the tax basis need to be consistent between companies and products. Next slide. On the following slides, we will discuss the importance of a sufficiently long phasing in period. We cannot emphasize the importance of this enough for the industry as well as the fiscus. National Treasury positioned the reason for the proposed six year phasing in period provided in the T Lab to be the precedent set by the same phasing in period in 2020, uh, 2018. The CISA members propose a minimum 10 year phasing in period. The economic climate in South Africa is currently very challenging, especially after COVID. The additional cash flow impact on the IFRS 17 transition, if phased in over a short period, could cause severe liquidity and solvency strain for insurers, which will contribute to increased systemic risk in the industry. Put in another way, besides having sufficient cash to pay the tax arising on transition, an insurer must ensure to that its assets also cover its policy liabilities. Transition amounts can result in a net surplus or a net deficit for insurers. A longer phasing in period will ensure a more sustainable tax cash flow from the industry to the fiscus. Next, next slide. The transition to IFRS 17 will result in a substantially more material impact if compared to the same transition, both in terms of the number of impacted insurers and the expected quantum of the transition amounts. The same transition had no or a small tax impact for most insurers. This is not expected to be the case for the IFRS 17 transition. It will impact virtually all insurers, big and small. The IFRS 17 transition at industry level is expected to be about three times more compared to the same transition, based on the numbers available from, from the PwC transitional impact study which was based on the 2019 and 2020 numbers from the industry. 
This means that the phasing in period provided for the same transition is not appropriate. The phasing in period should correlate with the materiality of the transition impact. 10 years was determined as an appropriate phasing in period by the Actuarial Society of South Africa, based on the outcome of the PwC transitional impact study commissioned in July 2021. This was also the independent recommendation. Next slide. The proposed phasing in period of 10 years is not only to manage unknown solvency and liquidity positions for the industry, but will also protect the fiscus from uneven tax contributions. The ongoing business as usual impacts have not been assessed to date due to a lack of available information. It is possible that an insurer has a transition surplus but that the ongoing BAU impact of IFRS 17 results in a lower tax charge if compared to the old IFRS 4. There is industry precedent for longer phasing in periods for material transition amounts. For example, the eight year phasing in provided for the locked in your business strain in 94. IFRS 17 is expected to be much more material. Then Lastly, on this slide, life insurance contracts in South Africa can span long periods. Under some whole-of-life contracts or life insurance contracts, this can be in excess of 50 years. A 10-year phasing in period is therefore very reasonable based on the long nature of life insurance contracts. Cash flows arise over the lifetime of the insurance policies. Therefore, we need alignment between the phasing in period and contract durations. We note that the United Kingdom determined their phasing in period for long-term insurers with reference to the average range of contract lengths on transition and confirmed a 10-year phasing in period. And then the next slide. The six-year phasing in period for long-term insurers in the T-Lab is therefore too short if compared with a three-year phasing in period for short-term insurers, especially if one compares the contract durations of the products sold by the two industries. We note National Treasury's concern about administering a longer phasing in period. We submit that the period of phasing in will not increase the administrative burden as the phasing in amount is fixed in the year of transition and merely phased in over the period. I will now hand over to my co-presenter, Melanie Maleski. Thank you, Liesl. We'll now turn to the phasing in mechanism and other important technical corrections. In the public feedback session on the 8th of September, National Treasury acknowledged that the proposed phasing in mechanism contained in the draft 2022 Taxation Laws Amendment Bill did not recognize the complexities of the five funds framework and results in unintended consequences and anomalous tax outcomes. National Treasury therefore indicated that it would consider revising the relevant provisions in line with the ASISA submission and would engage members further in this regard. The majority of ASISA members suggested reverting to the tried and tested phasing in mechanism, which adjusts policyholder liabilities. This mechanism was used in 2018 when SAM was introduced and is favored for the following reasons. The phasing in provisions were the outcome of a joint investigation conducted at the time by the then Financial Services Board, National Treasury, SARS and the industry and addressed potential unintended solvency and liquidity issues for the industry. In addition, minimal changes are required to be made to the existing mechanism, the, sorry, the existing legislation to implement the phase in. One CISA member proposed an alternative phasing in mechanism for the following reasons. It provides greater alignment between tax and accounting and reduces the compliance burden over the phasing in period. This mechanism also mitigates shortcomings of the phasing in mechanism proposed in the draft legislation. However, it should be noted that this alternative mechanism requires phasing in of capital gains tax impacts. Additional changes are also required to be made to the existing legislation to give effect to this mechanism. Proposed wording to be included in tax legislation for both ASISA proposed phasing in mechanisms was included in the ASISA submission, which was submitted to National Treasury on the 29th of August. National Treasury also acknowledged certain technical corrections required to be made to the proposed tax legislation. 
The most important of these relate to technical corrections in relation to the phasing in amount to ensure that anomalies do not arise due to reclassification of certain items between IFRS 4 and IFRS 17, and in relation to reinsurers to include investment contract assets in the adjusted IFRS value definition. To conclude, ASISA members are highly appreciative of the recognition of submissions made to National Treasury and SARS and the feedback provided at the public feedback session on the 8th of September. Due to the material implications and the technical changes required, ASISA members look forward to further constructive engagement with National Treasury and SARS, as suggested by National Treasury in the feedback session, prior to National Treasury finalizing their responses to the comments on the proposed tax amendments and prior to the finalization of the 2022 Taxation Laws Amendment Bill. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks very much, uh, Association for Savings and Investment, SA. Uh, let's move to uh, Saika. Thank you. Good morning, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members. I hope you're all well. Um, I'll start off today that we... You know self-timing, uh, Sharon. You are almost uh, like yes. a member of... <laughs> I know. Uh, I was best... <laughs> will call I, I know, and I've got my timer on, and I, I hopefully saved you all some time yesterday, so I'm, I'm getting better. <laughs> okay, okay. okay, so again, my, my presentation is broken up into to three areas. It's the policy matters, the technical amendments, and then again, the matters not included in the bill, and I'll discuss that in a little bit more detail at the end. So the two policy matters that we want to raise are the carbon tax policy changes um, and the changes to the recognized controlling bodies. I'll start off with the carbon tax policy changes. And our first concern there is that the rate increases are being proposed in US dollars. And the concern here is that South Africa, the South African Rand is one of the most volatile currencies in the world. And pegging this to, to the carbon tax rate is problematic because we, we're pegging it to external external externalities other than the uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So we did request clarity on this from, from National Treasury and they provided some feedback in the workshops, but it is still problematic for, for a lot of the taxpayers that this causes a lot of um, um, uncertainty on how to project their future tax liabilities, et cetera. And the next one relates to the structure and design of the tax-free allowances and the phase two, where we don't have sufficient detail on what is going to be happening, happening to them going forward. So we would like more information from National Treasury on their rationale, again, for, for using the uh, US dollar rate, um, as, a, as I said, pegging this to other externalities and not just, you know, the carbon emissions, et cetera. And then National Treasury has said that they will be releasing a discussion document. So we are thankful for that. And, and we hope that they will hold consultations uh, to discuss further the design of the second phase, the future of the credits uh, for renewable energy premium and the electricity e uh, levy to ensure that the past of the cost does not actually occur to the, the consumer. With regard to the recognized controlling body changes, the proposed change is that Uber will be removed as a recognized controlling body. Um, and as SARS presented to the committee, I think two weeks ago or last week, um, they said that it should be a simple transfer from uh, Uber to SICA because all of the Uber members have to be SICA. Uh, we want to note that it's not such a simple transfer and we have been in discussions with SARS on this particular matter. Just because they are a member with SICA does not mean that they are automatically registered as a tax practitioner with SICA. They would have to go through the whole tax practitioner registration process, and they would then also be subject to paying a fee, of course, but also subject to things that they were not subject before uh, to before, such as the CPD requirements, uh, CPD verifications and audits, tax compliance verifications and uh, criminal checks, et cetera, and not to mention the SARS induction program, but we have, we have spoken to SARS about that and it seems they will be exempted from that. So it's not as simple as it seems and all of this has to happen before the legislation becomes effective. So that we, we are in contact with, with SARS, it's, it's not as simple as they thought, um, but we are assisting our, our members that do want to transfer in that regard. Uh, the next concern that we have, and I think that's the important part, is that, as I said, some of these members were not subject to certain things. So the only 
body that is now left as a, a statutory RCB is the legal professional council. And, and we're saying this whole distinction between a statutory versus a legislative RCB, and it's something that we've had a problem with from the beginning, is that they were never subject to the requirements that all the other RCBs and tax practitioners were subject to, such as CPD requirements, etc. So we feel that now with the only one being left being the LPC, it is not time to do away with the whole distinction between these systems. Everybody should be subject to the same regulation, same requirements, etc. So yeah, that is our suggestion is to now remove this distinction, make it a, a fair playing field. Uh, there was no mentions of double fees, which is the case anyway, also concerns about um, you know, members having other responsibilities, but our members also have other responsibilities too. So we just feel equitably everybody should be treated the same and have the same requirements. I move on to the technical changes, and there's uh, five of them that I'll be discussing. I won't go into detail in these. I know um, some of the other commentators will, um, and it is in our detailed submissions. And, and a lot of these were discussed in the workshop with National Treasury uh, last week. So I think it, it, they are aware of the challenges, and we hope that they will take those into, cons uh, into consideration. The first one is the contributed tax capital. And as we know, the, the proposed changes are still to a certain extent problematic. It was discussed at length in the workshops with National Treasury. And, and the biggest concern is that, you know, it is going to hamper or affect the normal share buybacks and preference shares, et cetera. And, and yeah, our basic rec recommendation is they need to ensure that those transactions can still be continued. The wording will that just need to be refined. Um, and also these lead, the current proposal leads to practical changes that need certain considerations. For instance, you might have a dividend that is declared and you now have to go back and, and change it, et cetera. And how do you do that if it's in a different tax year, et cetera? So a lot of issues, I won't go into detail, National Treasury is aware of them and, and hope, hopefully they can be addressed. We then move on to the assessed losses and we thank National Treasury for providing more clarity in the workshops uh, with another example of how the proposed amendment will work for mining companies. Um, but we do feel that there are certain, uh, you know, there are many other amounts that are included in taxable income and not necessarily just for mining companies, but for other taxpayers as well. And we do kind of need an ordering rule uh, in respect of assessed losses uh, to be provided so that we get the calculation correct. The Section 72 VAT rulings, um, so as you know, all VAT rulings, the effective date of those um, were withdrawn from the 1st of January 2022, and there are um, changes proposed to cater for some of those rulings that were withdrawn, um, and those are to be, the changes are proposed to be effective from the 1st of January 2023. So there is a year period where taxpayers are non-compliant. And in the workshops, Treasury did ask some taxpayers, you know, have they been compliant? Some said yes, some said they are trying. Um, so the question still is, either way, um, taxpayers are going to be disadvantaged. So if they have now become compliant, if this, the, the changes come into law, they, they are then still going to have to go back to, to what they did before. And it's a whole complicated process. So we just don't understand why the effective date wasn't made 1 January 2023. Or if it is possible to become compliant, then is this legislation even necessary? Um, so I think that's just what needs to be simplified, but the simple solution is just to make the effective date the date that the uh, rulings ended. Then we move on to the Section 11 D R and D incentive. Uh, this was extended until the 31st of December 2023, and this is most welcome. Um, and we just want to point out here that, you know, it's um, a national treasury said there will be further improvements and innovation is critical. And it, it's very important because it drives value for the economy and the role of government is, is very important here, not necessarily doing the research, but funding the research. And just an interesting example is, you know, um, Google got US grant funding. Telsa got was supported by the US Department of Energy by 465 million. Solar X and SpaceX were supported by public support of various kinds. The iPhone got money from the Department of Defense. The touchscreen um, got the funding from the National Science Foundation. And Syria was funded by the Defense Agency in the US. So the government has a crucial role to play in research, and, and hopefully that will drive creation, innovation, um, and, and get our economy going again. So, so we welcome this change and hope it can be extended even further. On the tax compliance status, um, SARS has said that they will revoke third party access to the tax compliance uh, status of an individual if it is questioned by SARS due to you know, fraud, misrepresentation or um, non-disclosure. 
Now, the concern that we have here is that the word questioned, um, it is up to SARS's discretion, and this could be problematic. You know, there could be abuse in this regard. So although we do agree with the proposal, we have a concern that it might be subject to SARS abuse. And we do suggest that SARS actually provides the concerns to the taxpayer and then gives the taxpayer 10 days to respond to SARS's concerns that they have proved. Now, I move on to the last one, which is the matters not included in the bill. And, and this has become quite a problem for us because every year on year, we submit submissions to the NHSC process. We hold workshops with National Treasury, but not all of our submissions are included. Um, so we started asking ourselves the question, you know, is National Treasury even considering these issues? And some of them not big issues, they're small issues, but still don't find their way into the bill um, or into the budget and then into the bills. And then is the minister considering these issues? So we're not sure is National Treasury sending all of the concerns across to the minister or only some, and then he approves them. Um, we presume it's everything. And then he decides as, as um, it's constantly uh, reiterated in the workshops that he does decide what goes into the budget. And uh, our recommendation here is that, you know, uh, thank you to National Treasury who has agreed to have a workshop in early November to discuss all of these so we can get all the old issues out the way and start focusing on the new ones. But I want to highlight four different uh, areas that should have come in, or five, but I'll, I'll start with the first one. That's the associated enterprise definition. This has now been postponed uh, twice. And again, we still have no further comments from SARS in this regard for their interpretation. There's a draft interpretation. It still only gives certain clarity, um, doesn't give enough at this stage. We've got less than three months before this becomes effective. So again, should this be postponed, postponed, we say yes at this stage until we get more guidance on what this actually means. The other concern is the home office. Basically, I'm not going to go into the details. These were discussed before, um, but there is a policy concern because at the moment it is inequitable. Um, a person that owns a home will not be able to claim the interest on the bond, yet a person that does rents the house in which the home office is situated can claim uh, a, a tax deduction. So there's an inequity in the policy there. And we're not sure that that was the intention. So we do urge National Treasury to have a look at that. Um, the other one is the penalty for exceeding the carbon budget. Uh, it's not included in the bill. They say you wait, uh, National Treasury is waiting for the climate change bill to be enacted. Um, but again, that is, you know, we have to then have either the climate change bill, if it's not enacted, we need to expand the expiry date of the current carbon, carbon budgeting process, um, or we need to um, extend the date of the legislation and, and include the because the penalty cannot be included in climate change bill. It's, it's not a money bill. Um, I'm not going to go into the rest. It is in our submission. I've run out of time, but thank you for your consideration. And yeah, have a good day further. Thanks. Uh, thanks, uh, Sharon, for representing uh, Saika. Uh, and then uh, let's move to the next stakeholder, Busa. Yeah, Business Unity South Africa. Over to you. 10 minutes. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, my name is Kath Kavadia. I'm Chief Executive Officer at Business Unity South Africa. Let me just, I'm just going to do a quick introduction and then happy Kambule, who heads up uh, our climate change and environment uh, division at BUSA, will come in. Um, BUSA is a confederation of business organizations. We have a representation from every major sector in the country as well as the representatives representation from organizations that represent uh, the top corporates in the country uh, and and we our function is to ensure that business plays a constructive role in the country's economic growth development and transformation uh, so and and thank you very much for the opportunity for presenting here i just want to by way of introduction, say firstly that we are fully supportive of carbon tax. Uh, we appreciate the need for the tax. We appreciate uh, Treasury's uh, 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 imperative in 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 getting this done, uh, and and we have engaged with Treasury uh, uh, significantly on this, and uh, we welcome this input to the portfolio committee. What I would want to say by way of introduction is that the proposed changes to carbon tax come at a very crucial time in South Africa. We are certainly at BUSA, we are interacting with government 
on some very critical issues that uh, we hope if we are successful in addressing will have an impact on uh, investment and growth. Uh, the fact that South Africa does not have sufficient investment, uh, both local and global, the fact that we are unable to actually bring about economic growth to the extent that we need to, and in fact, our economy is not growing at all, uh, are issues that impede our ability to deal with things like unemployment, poverty, inequality, and just the ability of the government to deliver services to, to people in the country. And we are also in the process of recovering from COVID-19, uh, which had a devastating impact on the economy. Uh, climate change itself and the move to cleaner energy, the the, all the measures to address climate change and to do so in a way that we have a, a workable and uh, a pragmatic just transition pathway to minimize any damage to both the economy as well as to worsen our employment unemployment situation, all critical issues that business is dealing with. Uh, we see the opportunities in, in, in uh, moving towards uh, cleaner energy. We see the opportunities in addressing climate change, including the economic opportunities. But we do need to uh, invest in a just transition pathway to, to minimize any negative consequences. Uh, we will also need significant investment uh, 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 to, if we are going to take climate change seriously, and, and we've made significant and ambitious targets, uh, and, uh, and we have committed to ambitious targets, and, and we are concentrating and working on all of those. So that's the context in which we, we are looking at the current proposals on carbon tax. We welcome the extension of phase one and recognize the need to increase the rate of the standalone carbon tax. Uh, and, and there are good reasons for doing this. But we do have problems with the quantum uh, and the timing, US, uh, 20 US dollars by 2026 and 30 US dollars by 2030, we consider to be too high and too soon. Uh, and, and we would suggest that such prices make sense only after 2035. Uh, we also believe that incentives and some of the measures are important to assist and support the industry in its decarbonization efforts. Uh, and and uh, a mix of allowances and incentives should be uh, should accompany the carbon tax. Uh, we also need to compete globally and attract investment, and we need to ensure that the enactment of the tax does not actually uh, uh, inhibit our ability to do that. We also believe that the reference to US dollars is, is inappropriate in South Africa's legislative framework, and the Treasury must reinstate uh, rent based rate. So these are, that's the sort of context we are working in. And we believe that there is a requirement for a more detailed analysis of viable mitigation and socioeconomic implications to precisely decide the right time and headline price. We propose to study uh, viable mitigation of socioeconomic implications to determine the right time for the national treasury to understand better the taxes income on different sectors of the economy. So by way of that introduction chair uh, and setting the context, I would ask happy to come in and go into the detail of our submission which you have before you, thank you. Thanks, Cass. And I, I, I think um, as you have covered most of it, I, uh, I would like to focus the portfolio committee on four aspects. Really, it's really about the carbon tax rate, um, the carbon tax allowance and other supportive measures, the importance of enabling a just transition and the US dollar representation in the carbon tax. I think from, from, from what has been said, you've heard from Saika as well, that there are similar concerns concerning not only the rate, but also allowances and the carbon, uh, as well as the US dollar denominated rate. We are quite worried about that. But specifically on the rate, we, we, we're we looking at the fact that the, the increase in itself is too fast and too soon 
we don't have enough subsidies and enough allowances with incentives in order to um, eliminate some of the negative impacts that are there. We know some of what some of the negative impacts. Some um, companies and some sectors are already feeling the impacts of a low carbon tax, but it would be much higher, um, and it will be much higher in terms of the impacts that will be felt when the carbon tax rate increases at an unsustainable rate, as well as the actual headline carbon tax is quite high. So we're looking at allowances allowances that range from not only free allocations, indirect compensation, subsidies, ring fencing of the carbon tax um, revenues is quite important. And that is something that we're still battling to actually get a, 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 an understanding from in terms of uh, Treasury's approach. And also, as Asaika said, like funding and in, um, funding for in innovation technology uh, and research development is quite important, but that has not actually um, appeared. In other jurisdictions where carbon tax of, of a very high amount has been been implemented, you tend to find these kinds of allowances and incentives being placed alongside a very high carbon tax. And that's if we're moving in the direction of having a very high carbon tax, these are the kinds of incentives, these are the kinds of arrangements that can be supported alongside the carbon tax. Um, so with the carbon tax rate, I think it's quite important that as much as it is increasing very fast, we have to increase the allowances. However, the proposal to have a CPI plus 2% increase year on year seems to be much more doable. And I think most of industry has actually um, agreed to that as, as a way forward. We're quite worried about aspects of, of competitiveness, as, as Cass has indicated. One of the key issues here is that in other regions, because Treasury tends to use the, 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 the fact that this, this is an international kind of movement, is that in other regions where you tend to find uh, that there's either a price on carbon at the border, so if you have a carbon border uh, tax adjustment that occurs because either the country where the, the goods are coming from don't have a carbon price, a carbon tax, or some version of that sort, they, they tend to have as well, in some cases, a either a carbon border adjustment tax or they have a version of a carbon tax. If we increase our carbon tax at a higher rate, very fast, making it unsustainable for local industry, which is based in South Africa, to be able to compete internationally, we will tend to have a, a situation of more cheaper imports coming into the South African market and also then again decimating our industrial base even further than what it is right now. So we need to be able to uh, to protect our industrial base, to protect the jobs and make sure that we're actually investing and making the policy environment viable for reindustrialization, as that is our primary aim at this current point in time. So what are, one of the initial uh, uh, essential and initial points of the carbon tax is that it is one of those response measures that allows a country to be able to either fund a just transition or fund a transitionary process moving from high carbon emissions to a more greener and, and lower carbon society. Now, the context in which we're working in is that we are a highly fossilized economy and we're quite extractive by nature. So our general carbon emissions are quite high. But the carbon tax in itself can either fund processes which lead to the just transition or fund aspects that can actually contribute to the just transition or in itself can help the just transition as a policy lever, which that but what that means is essentially that as much as there are international standards or international uh, carbon prices. Uh, prices that are there, South Africa can work in a stepwise fashion, in a, in a pace that is affordable, in a pace that is scalable, and in a pace that allows for in integration of new technologies and the creation of new economic uh, sectors that will allow for the just transitioning, not only of communities, but workers, but also starts to address the primary concern of uh, high unemployment and youth unemployment. We are quite uh, worried, and I would not, I would not uh, repeat what Saik has said and what Kaz has said. But th th there is no real re rationale that makes sense at this point in time why we're we're linking the carbon tax actual rate to the dollar. Um, in, a few years ago, we were talking about ten dollars per ton. Now we're talking at uh, eight point five, uh, eight five, eight point five dollars per ton uh, at the current rate, which doesn't necessarily give us any sense of certainty, does not give us any sense of predictability, and the ability 
for companies to plan in terms of what they're going to be investing in is also at risk. So we would like to go back to the RAND uh, denomination and work from that basis because the RAND and dollar uh, link is far too uh, volatile. And just lastly, in terms of the recommendations, um, uh, honorable members is that we want that analysis that we can do together with with, with treasury you've heard a lot of um, uh, organizations and companies basically saying that there's a lot of work that needs to be done on different aspects of the t of the t lab because we want to work together and be on the same page as to what the trajectory is so we want that bottom up analysis that looks at key economic sectors and what's the switching price may be we want to move back from this uh, us denominated or us linked um, pricing going back to the rand and making sure that we're not actually moving towards this $20, 2060, uh, 2026, uh, and $30 to 2030, and just move with the CPI plus 2%, which it makes much more sense. Definitely, climate change is a, is a big problem. That's why we need to have a carbon tax. That's why we need to have a, a climate change bill. But we can't just do it all willy-nilly without having to understand the actual environment that we're in. And lastly, I think it is quite important that we recognize the extension of uh, of of phase one and make sure that in phase two we actually increase some of the tax some of the allowances and make sure that industry is uh, protected in the midst of this just transition thank you cheers uh, thanks very much uh, Busa, for your presentation uh, the next uh, stakeholder to present is Basa. Banking Association of South Africa. Offer to you, Basa, 10 minutes. Your mute is still on. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Um, I just want to show my face and I don't see the option of doing that. All right. Well, I'm on screen. Thank you so much. All right. Uh, thank you. Good morning. And thank you for the opportunity to be heard today, Honourable Chair and Honourable Members. Uh, my name is Jean Stegman and I present BASA on the collateral dispensation legislation. Um, I'm here today as the Tax Amendment Act of 2021 amended the 2016 collateral dispensation legislation and the draft rules for two, two, 2022 made no further changes to the 2021 amendments. So as we stand at the moment, the 2021 legislation will become effective on 1 January 2023. And we are here today just to request an extension of this effective date for a further year to allow for National Treasury and uh, SARS to engage uh, industry. We are aware that and thank National Treasury for already engaging with industry, but we feel that further engagement is perhaps required. And I just want to set the background as well is that the 2021 tax amendments have the best intention. And we fully support National Treasury's view that we need to clarify that uses of collateral outside of the collateral dispensation should not qualify for that dispensation. We support that. But we just think that the current drafting does not achieve this. And to illustrate with a very simple example, collateral is obtained by means of a collateral arrangement. And the person that takes in that collateral can then on post that collateral in a second collateral arrangement or reuse it for another purpose. And the issue comes in with the 2021 legislation that if there's a second posting of that collateral and there's default on the second collateral arrangement, that second collateral arrangement should not qualify for the dispensation. Taxes should be paid. We completely agree. But provided the first collateral arrangement is still intact, in other words, the collateral is returned to the original person that gave that collateral within two years. There's no reason to not allow the dispensation on the first collateral arrangement. So I think that with that in mind, that sets the scene of kind of what the 2021 Tax Amendment Act does at the moment. Um, so maybe then if I can move to the slides. 
just the uh, collateral dispensation was introduced in 2016 and it allowed for the transfer of cash and uh, non-cash, well, it allowed for the transfer of non-cash collateral, sorry, on a tax neutral basis. Um, so equities, bonds, without attracting SCT, income tax, CGT. Provided that the collateral is returned to the original person that gave the collateral within two years. And there is a clear benefit to taking collateral on an outright basis as opposed to receiving it by a pledge. The, as it is already in the name of the collateral taker, if there's default on a debt which that collateral collateralizes, then that person can realize that collateral immediately in the market to recover losses. And collateral takers can reuse collateral. And according to the 2016, that reuse was for any purpose, just but the reuse if it was not in terms of a collateral arrangement would trigger taxes. And that's certainly the way that uh, that industry has applied the legislation up until now or even going forward. So just to give a little bit of background, we do reuse collateral when the bank takes collateral or industry takes collateral. We, we use it for default to realize to recover our losses. We use it for regulatory compliance. So when we take in the collateral, we will typically uncollateralize it under repurchase transactions with a Saab, with banks. And this is really to comply with our HQLA, our LCR, our large exposure management under Basel III, or also to secure cash funding, overnight cash funding, also interbank or with the South African Reserve Bank. Um, we can always, of course, use collateral to use as, as collateral under further and unrelated debt obligation. Just one slide back, please. I'm not done there. Yeah, all right, let me just carry on here. Okay, so yes, so the reuse, um, the reuse was very important when we lobbied this legislation initially. Um, there isn't a sufficient collateral in the market to go around and especially considering regulations affecting, for example, initial and variation margining, we require collateral to collateral our positions under derivative positions, for example, and for that, we need collateral to be able to be reused. Otherwise, there is not sufficient eligible collateral in the market in order to meet our compliance requirements. Um, next slide, please. So, yeah, next slide. So, what happened in 2021? Next slide, please. So, in 2021, as the legislation now currently stands, Sorry, still next slide. All right, well, let me just carry on. So in, 20, in 1 January 2023, um, yeah, so the, the amendments were made then, and what it does is it gave us a, a list of permissible reuse. And it says that we can reuse the collateral purely for further compliant collateral arrangements repurchase and resale agreements, regulation A28 compliance and securing overnight cash payments. Um, so the explanatory memorandum gave the reason for the amendment as clarifying that any non-qualifying use is going to trigger tax. I think I'm just going to share my own screen because the slides are not moving. Can someone move the screen, the slides, please? Give me a second. Can you see the screw the can you see that? Okay. All right, is that clear? Yes. Yeah, All right, thank you. Right. So that was a list that National Treasury enacted in the TAA Act of 2021. And the reason for the clarification or the list was to clarify that any non-compliant use of collateral will trigger tax. We believe it's already clear in the 2016 legislation that any reuse of collateral outside of the collateral dispensation is going to trigger tax, and we don't need a list. Um, so we definitely agree with the principle with what is trying to be achieved. We just worry that the 2021 Act does not achieve this because it unwinds prior compliant collateral arrangements. Um, should reuse be for non-compliant use, but our view is the reuse will attract tax 
but provided your prior compliant collateral arrangement is compliant. In other words, the collateral is returned to that original person within two years and all of the other requirements are satisfied. That primary collateral arrangement is intact. The reuse triggers the tax, quite right. That is not a compliant collateral arrangement. So we just want to debate the drafting with National Treasury just to make sure that, that we achieve what we thought was the 2016 legislation. Next slide then. Okay, so just to summarize again, we fully support National Treasury um, in their recommendation that we need clarification. We fully support the principle that reuse outside of a collateral arrangement does trigger tax, and that is the way that we apply it at the moment. We believe 2016, the legislation at that time was adequate. We are very amenable to including a proviso to the 2016 legislation to clarify that reuse outside of a compliant collateral arrangement will trigger tax, happy with that. We just want to keep the primary collateral arrangement intact if it is still compliant in accordance with the act. Um, the, 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 the reason why this, uh, this piece of legislation is so critical to industry is because we have to collateralize and perform certain functions in terms of our regulatory compliance. And then also the quality of collateral in the market, there isn't sufficient eligible collateral to be transferred on an outright basis if we cannot reuse collateral. We have the option of pledge, but pledge is illiquid, we can't reuse it. And we have the option of cash, cash is expensive. And also with pledge, the foreigners are not amenable to providing us with collateral on a pledge basis. Their preference is outright. So what we are just proposing is just a postponement of the effective date to 1 January to, to, to 2024 to allow for further industry consultations. Just with regards to negotiating reuse, just obtaining certainty that reuse was also the, always the primary objective in lobbying the legislation, but that reuse triggers tax, absolutely. And there's no point in limiting reuse to a certain um, a list of permissible transactions because all reuse outside of collateral arrangements will trigger tax. We don't need a list. Um, and that also um, the, the prior collateral arrangement and what we call a chain of collateral chain, um, a chain of collateral, Compliant collateral arrangements within that chain should not be caught. It's only the non-compliant one that must trigger tax. Um, and also, if we want to just discuss abuse, what National Treasury is concerned about, then we would be more than amenable to bring in specific sections to address that abuse. And also, we just need to, again, uh, discuss the points about market liquidity, stability, our regulatory requirement to collateralize, initial margining requirements and variation margining requirements around derivatives, the quality of eligible collateral in the market. And we cannot constrain this by bringing in tax legislation that will severely impact the ability to move collateral around in the market. So yes, and then the last thing is again, redrafting the 2021 legislation to just add a proviso to clarify that non-qualified use of collateral will trigger tax, um, as opposed to providing this list of permissible reuses. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, thanks, uh, Baza, for your presentation. Uh, let's move to the next uh, stakeholder, PwC. Over to you. Thank you, Chair. Just waiting for uh, my slides to be put up. Stigman, if you could please stop sharing. Thank you. Sure. We are still waiting for you to stop sharing. Thank you. Sure. Sorry. Thank you, Chair. We're just waiting for those slides to come up. But uh, while that's happening, let me just do the intro in the meantime. Uh, so my name is Carl Manley. I'm the tax policy leader for, for PwC. Um, thank you for the opportunity to, to, to make these submissions to, to the committee. 
we have uh, submitted uh, a comprehensive set of written submissions, which uh, actually in, in include those that were provided to, to, to National Treasury and SARS for the benefit of the members. I, I don't, certainly don't intend to go through all of that. Um, there are just two uh, items, if you like, that I would like to, to, to draw your attention to and speak specifically on um, uh, as part of the submission. If we could move to the next slide, please. So while we, well, let me continue in the meantime while we're waiting for that slide to be moved. Um, so the, the first item that I'd like to, to, to address uh, is in relation to the concept of contributed tax capital. Uh, this is a contentious issue that's been uh, ongoing since the two, 2021 amendments from last year. Uh, just as a starting point, I think it's worthwhile just stepping back to remind the committee members what it is that we're dealing with. So. Contributed tax capital as a starting point is purely a tax concept. Uh, it is not impacted by uh, the company law or accounting principles. Uh, as I say, it's purely a tax concept. What it is in, in effect is the equity that has been contributed by shareholders to, to a company. Um, that equity or that, that CTC then is then apportioned, if you like, between each of the shareholders based on their pro rata shareholding. Uh, it is not allocated on a, on, a, on a per share basis, which is deliberate on the part of Treasury insofar as that's concerned. It's important, this concept, because it, it is used to distinguish between what constitutes a dividend and what constitutes a return of capital insofar as distributions are concerned. The reason why that is important is because there's different tax treatment in relation to those two different uh, types of distribution. Dividends are obviously subject to dividends tax, um, and that might vary depending on, on whether we're talking or, or depending on the nature of the shareholder in question and their, and their own tax attributes. Um, and returns of capital are, again, subject to different tax treatment in the form of CGT as a general principle, uh, whereby that is either reduced to reduce the cost of the of the shares in the hands of the shareholder, or where that cost has been reduced to null to to give rise to capital gains tax treatment. The concern that Treasury has is in relation to the situation where distributions are made uh, on a mismatched basis, if you like, to, to shareholders. Where, for example, one shareholder receives a dividend, and another shareholder rather than receiving a dividend, receives a return of capital. The reason why this might be uh, preferred from a shareholder point of view is because of those different tax attributes that I mentioned earlier. So for example, a foreign shareholder uh, might prefer to receive a return of capital rather than a dividend because uh, a, a dividend would be subject to dividends tax, uh, whereas a return of capital as a general proposition uh, would not be subject to, certainly not to South African tax in the hands of that, uh, that shareholder. And, and by contrast, a, 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 a domestic company that happens to be, uh, 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 sorry, a domestic company that happens to be a shareholder might pre even prefer to receive a dividend. So in the past, there has been the, the, this uh, manipulation, if you like, uh, for want of a better term, insofar as those just distributions are concerned. And that is what the 2021 amendment uh, attempted to achieve and uh, in addressing. And it does achieve uh, in addressing that mischief. The trouble is that it actually results in unintended consequences insofar as share buybacks and, and redemptions are concerned. Those two types of transactions, certainly in our view, do not give rise to the type of mischief um, that Treasury is attempting to, to, to address. That brings us to the 2022 proposed amendments. Um, those seek to refine the rule by introducing a, a new rule uh, whereby any uh, distribution of CTC um, must then, in, well, when there's another distribution within 91 days, either before or after, that must include a distribution of CTC as well. The trouble that we have with that amendment, with that proposed amendment, is that one, it doesn't fully address 
the concerns related to share buybacks and redemptions. There's still residual uh, potential anomalies and exposures that arise in the context of those types of transactions. And the second and just as important issue is that it actually reopens the door in some respects for, for the mischief that, uh, that Treasury is attempting to address uh, with the original proposal. Um, as well as resulting in, a, in, in, in further anomalies that, that might arise in the context of retrospective changes to, to, to the tax uh, attributes of the distribution. So, for example, you could have what was originally re regarded as a distribution of CTC suddenly becomes a, a, a dividend with retrospective effect uh, and the compliance administration and penalty implications that, uh, that might arise from, from that scenario as well. So what we're suggesting is to retain the 2021 rule, um, which does address the mischief in question, but then to provide for a specific exclusion from that rule for share buybacks. No. No. Can you, let me pause there for a moment. I know that the, the uh, presentation is not showing at the moment. So um, I don't know if you'd like me to, to share it before I move to, to my next slide and the next topic. Uh, Butle, what is the problem with PwC slides? I mean, presentation? I think the screen fro fro was frozen, say. So it wasn't moving. Somehow, between uh, Ms. Techman leaving the platform and trying to put uh, uh, Mr. Menu. Yeah, uh, you. Can... you are co host. Okay. You are right. so let, me, let me let me share quickly. Thanks. Can someone just confirm that you can see that uh, my screen? Yes, we can see your screen. So can, can, can you see my screen? Yes, we can, Carl. Maybe just make a presentation mode. Um, so the, the, the next um, topic I want to address is, is the carbon tax and you've already heard from, the, from SACA on certain elements of this and you've also heard from Compusa. I'm sure you're going to, looking at the agenda, you're going to hear a lot more about carbon tax from, from other presenters today. So I'm going to try and just uh, address the key aspects uh, as well. Um, you would already have heard some concerns around the proposed rate trajectory um, and concerns around that being dollar denominated. Um, I think it's key that it was clear that the, the rate trajectory is steep um, when you look at where we are currently versus where we want to get to in, in, in US dollar terms over the next few years. Um, I think what's important to bear in mind though is it's not just the case of those of the rate trajectory in dollar terms, but also the, the steep and the steepness thereof. But also you need to bear in mind that the way in which those increases have been formulated um, is that it could actually potentially re result in significant shocks in both 2026 and in 20, and, and in 2030. And that's simply because of the way, as I said, the way in which the actual increases um, in the interim period or in the interim periods have, have been formulated as well. So something to bear in mind there as well. But it's also not just the headline tax rates that we need to take into consideration. Even more importantly, we need to look at the effective tax rates, which currently can be as low as 5% of that headline tax rate be due, due to the various allowances that are available. There is a lot of uncertainty in 
uh, in relation to the future of those various allowances. We know the basic tax-free allowance is already going to go um, at the end of, or, or, or sorry, from 2023 onwards uh, as part of the carbon budget alignment. Um, we also have indications that the, the basic tax-free allowance is going to be phased down or phased up, depending on which language you, 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 you choose to, to accept insofar as that's concerned. But exactly what that looks like, we have no idea. Um, so certainly beyond uh, 2026, there's no indication of what, the, what those various allowances are going to look like. On top of that, as I mentioned earlier, we've got carbon budget alignment coming in 2023. Uh, I think Asaka mentioned the, there's been no proposed legislation so far as the, the penal rate for emissions in excess of, 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 of the carbon budgets are concerned. So again, we have no certainty in relation to, to that aspect. And then electricity price neutrality. 